Hey everyone, Alisa here from Flow Living and I am a little late today. Had a very late night last night teaching at Free People, which was so fun. I'm wearing one of their super cool tunics today that I'm feeling really uh, cozy in. I thought I would wear it. Um, and uh, yeah, had a, it was like a three hour jam session on periods last night. I didn't get into like 11.30, so I'm just catching up today, a little later than I normally like to be out. But it just keeps making me think that there, there may be time to start doing something in person. So let me know if that's something that's interesting to you. If you'd like to come hang with me live at some point, I would love to know that. So just let me know in the comments below. And th for those of you who are just joining, um, today we're going to be talking about all about vaginal health and protecting against UTIs and STDs and you know we're going to be kind of getting into everything but um, uh, we're also um, going to be chatting a little bit about um, my personal favorite supplements and things of that nature so I'm going to try to give you all my best strategies for keeping your vagina super happy and healthy. And for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, hi, I'm Elisa Vitti. I am the founder of F the Flow Living Hormone Center and the author of Woman Code and the creator of the My Flow period tracking and cycle syncing app. And if you haven't uh, gotten this app into your life, I want you to give it a try and see how it can not only improve your period, but also um, make you more productive and more creative and uh, all of that. So, I love it. I'm just seeing people. Oh, thanks. You guys like the hair like this? <laughs> My, I have a new hair person and so this is like his new thing and we did it last night for the Free People event so I'm trying to get used to it. <laughs> that, the new hair, the new tunic, it's, you know. Oh, and look, I have a new plant behind me <laughs> to decorate our little Facebook Live. Um, so I'm, I'm into my little orchids. I, I loved the color. It was actually a gift. It was very sweet. So yeah, let me know if um, hanging out with me live uh, would be something of interest. So, um, you know, I might, I might think of some way to do that. All right, and so before I dive in, I want to know if anybody's actively dealing with or chronically dealing with like a yeast infection or a UTI or struggling with like HPV. So kind of just let me know if UTI, yeast infection, HPV has been part of your life and you know all three and you know what things have you tried because typically you know it's basically always um, antifungals right um, either vaginally inserted antifungals for yeast infections or oh god I remember when I was on antibiotics for my skin back as a teenager I was getting chronic yeast infections and after I decided that I just couldn't deal with inserting something like, you know, a monostat, is that, is that the name of it, like a monostat, I was starting to take the Diflucan pill, right? So I would take that and I was like, oh, this is great. And, you know, this is when I was like 17, <laughs> before I had my awakening. And, uh, and yeah, so it was a whole um, chronic situation where I was, not knowing that I was taking something that was disrupting my microbiome and that it was having immune effects on my vaginal microbiome and then it was causing a whole sort of vicious cycle of chronic yeast infection. So yeah, so it's, and you know, and then UTIs on the other side of it too has, that has a similar pattern that can be equally vicious where you take them, you take an antibiotic to deal with your UTI chronically and you are always on these antibiotics and you can get a secondary yeast infection and your microbiome goes off and you're always getting like some weird viral infection or some cold or flu and you know between your bladder 
your vagina and your, you know, your head, you're feeling always like you're under it. And so I'm just reflecting that like that's a pretty common pattern. So if that's happening to you, sorry, I'm not used to sitting on a tunic. Um, so <laughs> if that's happening to you, um, you know, just let me know if that you've experienced that kind of um, vicious loop, you know, where you're kind of stuck in that. Um, and then of course, when they're chronic, um, it can start to seem to have like a cyclical pattern. Ooh, Nicole DeFranco just brought up another good point. Not to mention that if you're on the pill, the pill can definitely disrupt your microbiome and your immune system and you can be um, struggling with yeast infections and hormonal issues and all of that. And you know, why am I also throwing HPV into this conversation? Because you know, your immune system is your immune system and you know, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a second, but I just, uh, I, feel your, I feel the struggle. The struggle is real. Um, chronic yeast infection from pill every time take the first pill. Yeah, yeah, I'm reading your comments here. I'm just, I'm just saying yes, yes, because, wait, cancel because I see, I see what you've got going on. Yeah. Yep. All these things, all these things. All right. So let's dive into it. Um, Ooh, Tiffany, great question. Prepping for birth. What can you do to improve bacteria balance, uh, for a pregnancy? First of all, what a good mom you are already to be thinking about that. Can we get a little hearts for Tiffany? Because, I just love that you are thinking that way and thinking about what you can be doing. That's so smart and I'm so happy and proud of you and you're, you're a great mom already. So love to you. Um, okay. Ooh, bacterial vaginosis. Yes. Okay. I feel like I'm going to just be talking about all my health issues today and just letting you know my journey so I can share in ways that are relatable because I've had all of these things, every single one of them, and I'd be happy to share from the front lines of my vagina to yours uh, what, uh, what we should be doing. Okay, so obviously you're on this call or this Facebook video with me because you are really clear that you know this is not the, you don't want to be taking care of your vagina with wipes and soaps and lotions and it's really not that. It's an inside game of, of microbiome and immune system support um, and micronutrients, um, you know, and of course not taking medication, typically the pill that can really compromise your immune function as a whole. Um, I also think it's really important to establish, you know, just to say this for everyone who's listening, I want to say that it's very important for you to establish a baseline um, understanding of, you know, being familiar with your own vagina, its secretions, the smells, the fluids, so that you're very tuned into the earliest signs of when something might be off, right? Um, so, you know, that's an important thing for you guys to be paying attention to. It's just ways for you to use the biomarkers of your body. Um, but let's, let's talk about yeast infections first. Um, I'm just reading Marielle's little comment here. Okay, I think it's, I think, I, can you, you're, you're living free for the first time in 15 years. Does the pH balance of the body affect it as well as the microbiome? That's a great question. Um, yes, it's all connected. The, you know, if your body is very acidic or very alkaline, um, this will affect you know, how your body's immune system is acting and functioning. So the answer is you don't wanna be either extreme um, you want to be kind of a nice middle ground to have, you know, that's what we're meant to have. We're not supposed to be hyper alkaline or hyper acidotic. We're meant to be um, nice pH balance, right? So, you know, I think you don't want to 
do too much of sugar, which would produce more acid in the bloodstream, and you don't want to be doing like all alkaline causing al alkaline creating foods because then that you know can lower your pH, and sometimes that's not in your best interest, especially when you're dealing with chronic um, yeast infections. So just something to think about. What a nice balance. Um, all right, well let's start with yeast infections, and let's just start with some of the things that I think are really great. So the first thing to do when you realize that you have a yeast infection is to just a sort of address what might have triggered it, especially if you have a history of chronic yeast infections. So always look to the sugar in your diet. You know, did you go off your diet? Have you been drinking more alcohol? Have you, is it the holidays and cookies are involved? You know, I'm not sure what it might be for you or is it all of a sudden you decided to take a trip and you were eating bowls and bowls of pasta? What happened? Because there is going to be some trigger for you where you cross the threshold that of, of a place inside of you that your body can no longer keep up that's going to cause this to flip you back to where you're underneath the infection situation. So first I would look to the that and, and really clear the sugar out of your diet. Um, in this situation with yeast, it would be really great to move more in the direction of an alkaline diet, so having more green things and less sweet things would be a really good way for you to help deal with the candida overgrowth because they thrive. Yeast is you know, an organism that thrives on sugar, so in this situation, having less of that is great. Um, and then I would tackle it naturally. There's a company called Vitanica that I love. They have a vaginal suppository called Yeast Arrest, which is a boric acid and other herbal thing suppository that is so effective. And boric acid sounds really scary, but it is not. <laughs> and you know, you just put it in like any other vaginal insert and wear a little panty liner to bed. You do it at night. And you know, you, I think it's a three to five day little kit and uh, super, super effective. So that's my favorite non-anti, like non-monostat-like um, um, support for actually treating something that's really now out of control. But long term, I really like a product called Jaro Fendophilus for either the situation where you have chronic yeast or chronic UTI. They've, they've isolated a, two particular strains of bacteria that are essential for the urogenital area, and these both are so, so great. So these are kind of like my two yeast infection, tried and true, effective products. The other things that are important to do is to, some on the lifestyle side. So if you're someone who struggles with chronic yeast, you know, you want to really switch to like cotton. Oh, Katie, do you recommend organic plain yogurt for treatment? I do not recommend that you put organic yogurt or garlic or probiotics that are enterically coated and meant for your intestines. I do not recommend that you put any of those things in your vagina. I've read all sorts of things on the inter internet about, um, you know, people putting that kind of thing internally, it's not going to be effective, it's going to be messy, and it could cause other problems, so don't do it. And in fact, the, the probiotics that you're taking orally um, won't dissolve, So because the acid in your stomach is so much stronger, um, and they coat those pills to protect against the breakdown in the stomach, and so, uh, yeah. In fact, just because I was curious, I did test this out. I took my favorite enterically coated probiotic and tried it once, inserting it vaginally to see how it would work, and it did not work. I had to dig it out. So don't go putting that kind of stuff into your vagina. Use the Vit Vitanica Yeast Arrest. It's really good. There is a product. I'm trying to remember the name. There is a, there's one, here, let me see if I can Google it for you really quick. I, I remember discovering this being like, oh, I'm so glad somebody finally um, uh, in, developed this. Uh, there's one vaginal, vaginally inserted probiotic that I saw. 
that you actually can. Oh yes, here it is. Flora Femme Vaginal Probiotic Suppository. It is excellent for yeast and BV. And this is something that you can use all the time. Um, so it's a really good um, probiotic that you insert vaginally that you can use as like a supplement, especially if you're struggling with chronic BV. Really, really effective, really great. Lots of women like it. Super, 11 different super strains of bacteria. I think it's a really great product. So that's a really, really good one. Um, yes, Genestra in Canada, it's hard to get access to those uh, here. Um, and so there's that. Um, okay. So Tiffany, Florafem prep for birth, yes, plus another, like, so that's just for your vaginal balance, but I would also say you wanna do probiotics for your gut and your regular microbiome as well. Um, and then in general, immune boosting supplements are really good. So vitamin C and zinc, I think are always nice to take um, whenever the immune system is being overloaded with an, an overgrowth of bacteria. So think of it like you have a cold, right? And you would take some extra vitamin C and some extra zinc at the same time is a good thing to do for any of these, for UTI, for yeast, for BV. Um, all right, let's talk about, um, let's talk about, I'm looking at, I'm looking at everyone talking about his enemy. Love Wellness, yeah, I've heard about Low Bosworth's company. I haven't tried any of her products. I would love to check them out more, um, but I've heard, I mean, I'm curious, it seems like they're good. I just haven't, I haven't personally tried them, so I can't say whether or not um, I know th for certain that they'll be effective, but they seem um, well thought out. All right, let's talk about UTIs, now that we've talked about yeast infections. Oh, there was one more thing. Um, if you have chronic yeast infections, I want you to um, really look at switching up your panty situation to cotton, all cotton underwear. Um, you just so that you have more breathability, you're not putting on, you know, rayon or polyester that's going to sort of trap moisture and bacteria in the vagina and make overgrowth of yeast, you know, more problematic, right? So cotton, cotton undies if chronic yeast infections are a thing. And if you're someone who likes to wear yoga pants all day, <laughs> make sure they're you know, a new pair every day if you're getting over a yeast infection, just anything that's like, you know, where, especially yoga pants, because they're not all cotton, you know, you tend to have more moisture buildup there as well. So just be aware of what you're wearing close to the skin. And if you're not on your period, sleep panty free. If you can, if you're not actively treating with a suppository, sleeping panty free, letting air circulate is a good thing. Um, that's an old school, treatment that is very good. <laughs> um, Karen, Karen Brissesi is asking, are my supplement recommendations the Jarofemdophilus? Jarofemdophilus is something that I recommend for UTI, bacterial vaginosis, and yeast infection. That is what it is great for as a um, something that you use while you're actively struggling and something that you can use as a preventative if you're prone to chronic recurrence. So it's one that's definitely in my hormone health home medicine cabinet. Um, and this is a great way to, to stay healthy. And you know, a lot of you are talking about your experiences with, you know, taking different medications to treat these things. It is a slippery slope. It's, it seems like the I mean, gosh, who wouldn't want to take one pill to fix something? It's such a nice, it's such a seductive idea, but then you have this downward spiral of it kind of breaking something else, your digestion, um, or, you know, disrupting something else. Can you take another probiotic with Jarofendophilus? Yes, and I recommend that you do. So different probiotic strains do different things. So Femdophilus is really specifically two strains of bacteria that are in essential for the urogenital tract, um, and 
then I, t I take a Jaro, um, what's it called? Just their sort of non-refrigerated um, probiotic, I just take that on occasion. Um, so, and then someone just mentioned Saccharomyces boulardii. Uh, that's not something I would necessarily recommend. That you would use kind of um, in conjunction with long-term antibiotic use. So that's not necessarily something that you need here. Okay, let's talk. No, Dominique, thank you for bringing that up. This is very interactive. I feel like we're all having burning, literally burning questions today. <laughs> so I didn't cover that already. So the only time you get yeast infections is if you have sex. Um, and then the day you have sex, three days later, you're getting an infection. Okay, so I don't know how the sex is going down. However, if you are um, not using condoms, that can actually potentially make it more problematic for you. So I would do an experiment where you use condoms instead and you're using um, you know, more natural lubricant. So Sustain, uh, Sustain brand is a new favorite of mine from their condoms to their lubes. I really love their product line. They even have, I'm pretty sure, um, some sort of cleansing wipe that you could use if you needed to. But my favorite thing to do after sex, and this goes again for UTIs or yeast infections, is after you have sex, get up and pee and wipe yourself with just regular toilet paper. That's fine, totally good. If you're someone who um, is like in Dominique, in your case, if it happens every time after you have sex, then um, you may want to get up and take a little shower as well, right? And just clean up um, just, to, just to see if that will help. And then also the, the, you may be caught in a cycle where you haven't healed from the previous infection and you're having sex again too soon and it's sort of compounding the problem. So there's something going on there that needs to be sort of addressed. I know it's tricky stuff. Um, let's talk about UTIs for a second. So I haven't talked about my birth story, but it, I, and I don't want to get into the whole thing because I do want to talk about it at some point. Um, but anyway, without sharing all the details, um, I ended up with contracting a UTI from the hospital experience. And I, I promise I will tell my birth story. I, I don't know why I haven't had a chance to. I, I want to, <laughs> but I don't want to give it all away now while we're talking about UTIs. But anyway, and I remember um, being in my recovery room the first, yeah, like the first few hours after I gave birth. And I was like, something, you know, and I know my bladder. I, I don't know. I feel it. I feel things very I'm very sensitive to my body's cues at this point. So I remember saying, mm, my bladder is feeling a little twingy, is what I said. And I said, can you test me for a UTI? So they're like, oh, there's no way. And I said, just, just do it. So they're like, wow, yeah, you have like a really mild case. Do you want to take a probiotic? I mean, I'm sorry, an antibiotic. <laughs> do you want to take an antibiotic for that? And I said, you know, no, because I'm breastfeeding and that particular you know, the antibiotics that treat a UTI can pass through the breast milk and I didn't really want to do that to my daughter and blah, blah, blah. So I didn't take it. And I'm still happy that I didn't take it. But this particular strain of the UTI that I contracted had been pretty gnarly and I have been dealing with it on and off since I've been giving, since having given birth. And so I've really been putting my protocol to the test here that I'm going to recommend for you um, and and I and I love this protocol because it's it works it's effective and it doesn't require me to take any antibiotics so when I say I've been dealing with it on and off you know it's like a handful of times and nothing that I would be so concerned about uh, so what I do is I don't um, really take cranberry I've, uh, I've decided that I'm not a big fan of cranberry for UTIs. I know, it's crazy because that's like the thing. You know what I'm a big fan of for UTIs? It's gonna blow your mind. Are you ready? Cilantro. 
cilantro. Boil some cilantro. You know how like when you make chicken soup, you like throw the herbs in and you boil it for a while? Boil up some cilantro, half an hour, no, 20 minutes, nothing. Throw out all the leaves, drink the water throughout the day or two days. I make enough for three or four days and I just drink it. Cilantro has some powerful plant medicine, one of which is you know, antimicrobial, majorly antimicrobial. I love a cilantro for UTIs. And of course, in the summertime, if you wanna like make a cilantro tomato salad or whatever, you can have that very preventatively, super, super great. But anyway, that's, the, that's herbal medicine that I will use. I will take the Jaro Femdophilus. I will take vitamin C and zinc to deal with it as a bacterial infection like I would any bacterial cold or something. And then I will take D-mannose. And I'll take D-mannose, if I'm tr actively treating that infection, I will take a dose every three hours um, for several days to really make sure that I'm keeping the bladder from any sort of colonization of that bacteria. And I will be on that you know, protocol for a week to 10 days, and I'm good to go. So that's my personal recommendation to you is to try that because the problem with chronic UTIs and all the research that I've done is that, you know, and, and a lot of this research, by the way, comes from studying um, uh, long-term geriatric in-home in care, like when their people are living in um, geriatric care facilities and they're in, you know, they have to have catheters and they're having all sorts of issues or they're not moving a lot. and and they struggle um, with UTIs in addition to the fact that hormonally when you're producing very little hormones, um, which can happen you know, in your 60s and 70s, uh, that you are more susceptible as a woman to chronic UTIs. And so they were trying to figure out like what to do and, and actually why I decided against cranberry as an effective treatment was because they did an extensive study of cranberry extract in this geriatric population. They found it had no real effect. Now, if you take a Cranactin supplement as a preventative and you feel that it's helping you, there's no harm in it. But I don't think taking cranberry pills or cranberry juice alone is going to do what we hope it will do. Um, but the D-mannose does flush the bacteria. It, does pre it prevents the bacteria from adhering to the lining of the bladder and allow it to be flushed out and the cilantro, um, you know, again, also antimicrobials, actively fighting the infection, but also is a diuretic, so you're going to be urinating more, which is ideal in the case of you having a, U uh, a UTI. So that's something that I really like for that. Um, and again, when we think about UTIs and someone who has a chronic UTI and is having sex, right, you want to think about multiple pee breaks depending on how long your sexual encounter is but you know just a little fun fact for you every time you have an orgasm or a climax your body has gone through a pretty powerful cortisol and lymphatic flush from the process of building up through orgasm and climaxing so that means all of a sudden there's a ton of fluid that has been released as well and it wants to come um, you know it's being processed through the kidneys and wants to come out in the bladder so if you all of a sudden are you know you're doing your foreplay you're having play before potentially even intercourse and you notice all of a sudden that you're like you're not feeling as responsive as you were maybe 20 minutes ago I'm telling you you need a pee break so get up and go pee empty your bladder come back and you're gonna be fully sensitized to potentially have another orgasm or start if you're having heterosexual sex with penetration with your partner um, and you're going to have more orgasmic results from an empty bladder situation than you would with a full and you're not going to be holding uh, anything in and so multiple so pee you know after your clitoral stimulation and before penetration and then pee immediately after penetration has ended so i would say two pee breaks for my chronic UTI girls and one post-sex pee break for yeast infection, okay? Uh, so there's that. Um, I know we're getting real intimate today, I love it. <laughs> so those are my 
tried and true strategies. Of course, if you have any questions as I'm talking, because this is all very interactive, please, um, please let me know. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. You are asking questions, and <laughs> I didn't scroll. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, hold on, let's see. Um, da, 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 da. No, don't do douching. No, no, no. Just wash with regular soap and water. You don't need special soap. You don't need vagina soap. No, but no. Did you know that the vagina is the most efficient self-cleaning orifice in your body? So you don't need to worry about it with special soaps. You just need to potentially wash because you're dealing with chronic yeast or BV just because it will help if you've had any other um, fluids from anybody else entering into your own body's balance. That's all. Um, so, okay, yes, pumpkin seeds. Does juicing cilantro have the same benefit? Um, I haven't tried juicing it. The reason why I decoct it, which is the technical herbal herbalist term, right, where you um, extract the nutrients from the herb either by steeping them in alcohol or boiling them. Um, it's, you get more bioactive um, plant medicine from it if you decoct it in one of those two ways. Of course, the alcohol preparation is the best, but I don't do that and I'm not sure if you can buy cilantro in the alcohol decocted form. So, you know, I would say making the tea is the best second thing to that and then juicing you could certainly try it Christina but I'm not sure how that would work I think you could add it to um, some other juice or smoothie that you're making again it's just an ongoing preventative thing I mean cilantro has multitude of health benefits so you can't go wrong with it it's a liver detoxifier it's uh, anti-cancer it's wonderful um, so that's really good um, Ella Hi from Slovenia. Hello. I'm so glad that this is helpful. Lemon juice and water. Pamela Verschuren. Ooh, I just, I don't know where that accent came out. Um, <laughs> I'm just trying to pronounce your last name. Um, lemon juice and water for what? For, um, for UTIs? You know, lemon juice is great. It has a lot of great health benefits, full of vitamin C. So yes, you could use it sort of as surrounding support, but I wouldn't, you know, necessarily say that that was going to be the magic bullet. And, you know, and as we're talking, as you can hear, there isn't one magic bullet, right? You want to be supporting the immune system as a whole, helping with pH balance, working with your diet, um, taking supplements that are going to be really helpful. It's a process of working with your body to bring it back online. And, and I also, just because again, I have been someone who struggled in my teen years with chronic yeast infections and most recently with some chronic UTIs that I you know, didn't anticipate having to deal with, um, I, I know that it's a real drag. It's a real drag when like the down there is not a happy camper, right? So I get that there's like a frenzied feeling of like, I just want to fix this. What's the right thing to do? And I, having gone through it myself, um, will always be honest with you you know you have to work with your body be patient keep at it and eventually you will round the corner and here's another thing I want to say the other thing that was compounding um, my chronic UTI situation was the fact that I have been have been breastfeeding you know my daughter will be three in the fall and I'm finally down to one nursing time per day we do it just before bed now that's our we just made that switch it was two times a day for a while and I finally had enough and so <laughs> I waited for my luteal phase which I'm in now and I um, dropped the morning feed just a couple days ago so we're just down to one feed a day but when I was nursing on demand for basically two solid years on demand day and night all night all throughout the night this has a suppressive effect on estrogen levels and just like in the geriatric community where chronic UTIs in women are a big problem due to lower levels of estrogen in your postpartum life you're more susceptible in the first year postpartum to BV UTI and yeast infection for those same reasons so just in case any of you are new moms and no one told you that now you know and here's another thing a lot of women um, end up with a little bacterial vaginosis right after they give birth 
um, because of the old wives' tale that you should have a lot of sex before to help you kickstart labor, and and everyone's like, well, who needs to wear a condom because um, we already made the baby? So there's a lot of uh, semen entering the vagina, which whose pH has changed, um, and, and your immune system has changed, and your hormones are dropping as you approach labor, um, and so you're in this situation where you may end up with a little BV or yeast infection after you give birth. Um, and you know, in the case of postpartum BV, the best news that I can give you is you don't really actually have to do anything. You can just wait it out. It will go away on its own, usually within a week or two. Uh, in the case of a yeast infection and breastfeeding, that's a little bit more problematic and you would wanna do um, something to deal with that as quickly as you could, like depending on how your vagina is doing, you know, a suppository. Um, that can be trickier if you've had a tear. So yeah, it gets a little complicated, you know, especially with postpartum, um, you know. Uh, okay, I'm just scrolling through. Lauren Gendler, I just got here. Hi, welcome. You're, have I talked about yeast and, yeast and pregnancy? Can you refine your question for me? What do you, are you talking about like the postpartum? Or are you talking about yeast infections during pregnancy? I will say that um, UTIs during pregnancy are very problematic. And um, you know, that's why you're always taking the P test when you go for your GYN visit, your OB visit, um, because you know, you don't want to end up with a kidney infection. Um, but again, you, you could be taking d as well to prevent uh, any of that from getting that far. Um, uh, yeast infections during pregnancy and bacterial vaginosis and UTIs, all three of those things can trigger preterm labor, um, which is why you, know, you would wanna guard against them. So yeah, it's something you do wanna you know, take seriously and, and make sure that you're monitoring. Um, uh, Lorraine Price Turner, every time you're too acidic, too much sugar, it's causing UTIs. Is this related or is it something else? Definitely related, right? We're talking about your immune system as a whole. You know, I was just teaching last night at Free People in Soho, which is why my hair looks all fancy and I'm wearing another one of their tunics today. And, you know, I, one of the myths that we have to really just dispel as women is that you don't spot treat any symptom of your body. You know, you don't take a, a pill for your acne and another pill for your period problems and then another pill for your UTIs. You see, you are part, your body is one cohesive unit and when you have chronic infection and chronic hormonal imbalance, you need to address it as a whole. So um, yes, Lorraine, if you're noticing a connection between too much dietary sources of sugar and your immune system getting overwhelmed by the um, you you being too acidic and you having all that sugar to feed lingering bacteria and causing an overgrowth, then yeah, for you you want to like go away from high sources of, of sugar. So maybe switch to berries instead of you know bananas for a while, things like that. Um, Maria Mukase, how about the smell? Can our smell tell us something about our health? Yeah, absolutely. Every thing that your body has to offer you to observe in one of your senses is a biomarker that it, you can use because it's your body's way of saying something to you. It's, it's, it's conversation to you, with you. So yeah, a different change in the smell of your vagina um, is something for you to pay attention to. You know, it should have a healthy musky scent to it, um, like you worked up a good sweat. And then if it starts to have a little off smell to you, then something's going on. And now there are so many great home testing kits that you can use. Um, there's something, there's a, the same stick that you can go to your gynecologist to pee on. You can pee that, pee on a stick at home to test for UTIs or other potential infections that would then trigger you to say, oh, I need to go and have a further evaluation. So there's a lot that you can do also to back up your sense of smell to say, oh, you know, I think something's off. Let me pee on a stick and see if my nose knows. So definitely. Um, uh, let's see. Mm. Je Jess Renee Hilsey. 
very UTI prone by nature, shorter urethra than most. Yes, that is a real phenomenon. Shorter urethra, shorter vagina, that does happen. You avoid caffeine, dairy, alcohol, gluten. This has helped you to stay UTI free. This is, Jess, you're sharing a great example of what I was just trying to say, which is that your body is part of a cohesive unit of health maintenance, right? And so for you, reducing any foods that are inflammatory, right, the gluten, the dairy, and any sugar or things that are going to throw off your blood sugar, the caffeine and, caffeine and the alcohol, is definitely going to support your immune system. So you take Jess's example here as what is required to be a healthy person is general good health care practices plus a little extra supplement support. Um, okay. All right. Let's see. Jess is also saying that she also had the UTIs while breastfeeding for a while. It is pretty common and it's not something that's talked about. I was, listen, you know, it was my first time at the rodeo having a baby, right? And I was really surprised yet again to just see how much information is, is not something that we just go into our, these major life moments knowing. Like we don't go into puberty knowing what's going to happen or having how to deal with our hormonal imbalances. We're not front loaded with this information. We're not front loaded with information about postpartum and what to expect and how to, how to deal with it. So I, uh, I was yet again seeing just how there's like a whole, how some of that not having access to information can really be something that we end up basing healthcare decisions on that we might, might make different decisions later on. Um, okay, let's see, I'm scrolling through. Okay, Lauren Gendler, yeast and pregnancy, you don't want to use D-mannose for a yeast infection. D-mannose is only for a UTI, right? So for if it's just a pH imbalance, you know, I think that would really be more about a dietary change and again, getting away from sugar and dairy, you know, cow dairy, you could use some goat or sheep dairy, um, things of that nature to help balance your diet as a whole to help your immune system function. Um, all right, let's see. Mm, Anna, this is so much fun. Public pools. <laughs> Just sharing my thoughts on public pools. <laughs> Keep your vagina in the ocean or at home. <laughs> That's really my, my thinking on it personally. I'm not a big fan of chlorine pools because they can definitely cause all sorts of problems. Most notably, if you're someone who's struggling with any thyroid issues, you do not want to be taking a, a chlorine thyroid destroying bath all the time. You know, your skin is your largest organ and you will absorb a huge amount of chlorine, um, which will disrupt your thyroid health and balance by being in public chlorinated pools. So. Um, yeah, that's tricky. That's a tricky one, if, especially if you don't live near the ocean. What do you do? Um, I'm not sure. Salt water pools. I saw an article on motherjones.com about how to make your own natural like ecosystem of a pool in the backyard with like lily pads and, you know, like real plants to actually clean the water fascinating. I mean, I don't know if I want to be swimming around in the backyard with like lily pads and frogs, but that's also kind of cool too. So, you know, interesting, interesting. Um, oh, Danielle, sorry, you can't watch it live, but yes, you can watch it later. Okay. BV. Can we touch upon BV? Let's touch upon BV. Um, okay. I like the following things for bacterial vaginosis. Um, Vitanica makes a product called Bacteria Arrest, which I think is really great. Femdophilus and liquid chlorophyll I like as well for bacterial vaginosis. And again, the th we're talking about general immune system support here for the body so that the vagina and its microbiome can perform better. So I don't want you to think of it as two separate things. So whatever supplements I'm suggesting that you take for the BV, I also want you to be thinking about a larger supplement and dietary shift that's going to address your immune system, which is the what the flow protocol will do. Um, 
as well. So if you're struggling with these things chronically, I couldn't recommend more that you do the monthly flow program to really balance your system as a whole to get your blood sugar stable. So much of disease is predicated on and bacterial overgrowth is predicated on you having the wrong amounts of sugar and disrupted insulin levels in the body. And what's step one of the flow protocol? Handling that, right? Stabilizing your blood sugar. So if you really want to le learn how to use food to balance these things, I, I couldn't recommend monthly flow more. Um, okay, let me see if I'm scrolling. Wow, this it's already 3 o'clock. Crazy. Hold on. Scrolling. Bring on the natural backyard pool. That's awesome. Yeah, motherjones.com. Um, let me just see if I can quickly pull it up for you. Mother Jones natural pool. No, I can't find it, but I'll, I'll try to find it. Um, they, have a whole, they had a whole cool article about it. So interesting. Um, okay, I want to talk about HPV um, <clears throat> as well because we're talking about immune system support and we're talking about the, how your immune system and your vagina's health are, are interrelated here really today. I think that's the big takeaway from today's conversation is that it's not two separate things. It's your one integrated system, okay? And HPV is a really interesting place where we see that uh, as well. So um, I myself at one point had an episode of HPV back in my, I want to say, I want to say it was my early 30s, but it could have been my late 20s. Can't remember exactly. Anyway, <clears throat> and I had a small... Um, biopsy done obviously you need to biopsy these cells um, which is not pleasant and there's a whole recovery process there but nonetheless uh, luckily it was benign and so <clears throat> I wanted to really treat the underlying immune issue there and so I went on sort of a whole HPV protocol of um, vitamin C and zinc and folic acid and beta carotene and selenium uh, and some echinacea and you know just really did that pretty consistently for two three months you know to never come back so I think that there's a lot of great research to show that there are wonderful ways that you can use supportive immune supportive supplements to really help with HPV if you've had it um, and, but I do think that it's important to make sure that you work with your gynecologist to get it biopsied, to make sure that there's no, um, you know, cancerous lesions that you're really working on um, your immune system as a whole and taking the best care of yourself. You know, so it's, this is really just about making sure that you understand that there, there's a lot that you can do. You can get personally involved in your body's well-being you don't have to feel like all of a sudden something's happening to you it's out of your control and there's nothing that you can do to help in the case of utis yeast infections bacterial vaginosis and hpv think about your supporting your immune system as a whole taking supplements that are going to really balance your immune system as a whole and working with your physician to help you monitor your progress because you will be able to test to see whether these things are cleared up and gone or not, right? And so that's the wonderful thing too. You want to work in a team with your physician to really make sure that you're getting those results because we want you to be happy and healthy. So, um, okay, I'm just going to scroll through. A um, couple more questions here. Alexandra, only wash with regular soap and water, no special products, no douching. Um, Diana Delorio, if you're having abnormal cells, uh, HPV abnormal cells, you will need to proceed with, you know, full removal of those cells, and then you're going to have to proceed with whatever your doctor recommends, and also um, supporting your immune system as a whole for sure. Um, 
Uh, okay. Sophia, your recommended boiled cilantro, vitamin zinc, vitamin C, zinc, D mannose for preventing, prevent, I, for treating UTIs. For preventing UTIs, I think cilantro tea as a, as a preventative drink a couple times a week, super good. You know I, what I haven't tried but that I should? We can all try it together if you want. Sorry, I'm not used to wearing tunics. I gotta get, <laughs> I gotta get my tunic game going here. Um, you could, you know, take your already pre-made um, cilantro tea and have some before sex and have some as a refreshing cold beverage after. I drink it cold. I don't tend to drink it hot. Has it, have it as a refreshing cold beverage right after, you know, because you drink water probably after you have your sex, right? So have some cilantro tea instead. I'm going to try it. Let's try it. Um, uh, okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Recommendations for a gyno. You know what? I'm going to answer this question even though it's slightly off topic because I just was doing a private session for a client a couple of hours ago and she asked for a similar recommendation out in L.A., and here's what I want to say. This is what I said to her. This is what I'm going to say to all of you. Um, I, and this is what I even said last night. It's, you have, to, you have to just keep in mind that your doctors are being trained in a particular way and they're not necessarily being trained in functional medicine. And so you can't be mad at them for that, but you also want to see how you can find a better fit. So. Typically what I find works for me when I'm choosing a doctor is the younger they are, um, doesn't always happen this way, but it's because some doctors, regardless of their age, will be on top of current research and what's changing in our cultural conversation about what's healthy and what's not, like, you know, some, for example, who knows, a doctor could think to, to her, him or herself, oh yeah, it doesn't matter if you're eating organic food or food grown with pesticides, that has no bearing on your health. Whereas another doctor who's doing different kinds of research in their patient care you know, maintenance would say, oh no, it definitely makes a difference. And that could be someone of any age. But I find that younger doctors who have grown up most recently in a culture who values more organic foods and healthier lifestyle, even though they're not necessarily getting trained in that in medical school, will be bringing that awareness to conversations with you. So if you know that's something that can be useful for you, great. Otherwise, just ask the question, right? When you're interviewing for a physician, you wanna ask you know, two key questions. What are your thoughts on you know, n natural, uh, and healthy lifestyle factors as it as it pertains to disease. Do you think it has an impact, for example, for me to be eating organic? And just listen to what they say. That They will tell you right away if they share your values. And then the second question that I always say to ask is, um, you know, uh, I'm a person, I always frame it this way because it's true, I'm a person who's very involved and informed uh, regarding my own health and my and my care plan and I like to collaborate with my physician on whatever treatment or course of action we're going to take and then I ask how do you feel about working with a patient who is very informed and asks a lot of questions and wants to participate in the dialogue and the process with you and depending on how the doctor answers will let you know if they are open to that or don't like that and obviously you're gonna want someone who would wanna be open and work with you. So I think it's important to recognize that when you go and meet with a doctor, that if it's someone that you're meeting for the first time, that you are in fact interviewing them and considering to hire them for your health care team. And you may have to go on a couple of first dates before you find the right fit, which is very different than kind of how we are typically led through the process, which is, well, you just like go and see whoever, and then you wait until there's some big problem, and then you switch later. You know, that's unnecessary. You should just be in the mindset that you should interview a few specialists before you pick someone. And then the third thing, of course, in the process is chemistry, that un 
un intangible thing, right? So um, I always really just l feel my heart and my gut in meeting a person and just say, you know, how do I feel? Do I feel comfortable? Do I feel safe? Or am I tense? Am I relaxed? You know, would I sit here and chat with this person for extended periods of time and, and feel uplifted by that? Or do I feel, you know, stressed? And I really let my body's re physical reaction and emotional reaction to being in the presence of the other person also inform the decision ultimately. So those are the three things that I personally use to choose a physician is how open are they and how much do we share values on healthy li lifestyle factors uh, as something that clearly benefits health? Um, and you know, how open are they to working with me as a very informed and very proactive patient? And then three, how do I feel just generally in their presence? That's how I would recommend that you go about picking your physicians as well. All right. We have chatted about vaginas for an hour, and obviously we can keep talking, but <laughs> I hope that this was helpful. And um, you know, keep your questions coming. I always read all the comments after, these, after I publish this, just to see what people liked, what they learned, what other additional questions that they have, what other topics they'd like me to talk about. So keep the conversation going, and let me know, even if you're watching this, when it isn't live and you have something that you want to add or some question you want to add, I do read. I do want to know what you're thinking and what else you want me to talk about as I'm here every Thursday at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time answering, uh, and answering your questions live and also bringing up conversations about things that we need to know about as women. So thanks for joining me. Thanks for sharing this with your friends. Please share this on your own Facebook page when, the pub, you know, when I repost the when I publish the video, you can share it. Um, let some other people know that you liked this video. And I appreciate uh, spending my Thursdays with you. I love that I get to talk to you about your lady parts all the time. Thank you, guys. Thank you for all the love. Thank you. That's so nice. And I will see you next week at 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time talking about something equally juicy. Until then, take a really good care of your ovaries and don't forget to download the MyFlow tracker. If you haven't downloaded it and tell some friends about it and uh, you know, we're here at the Flow Living Hormone Center if you need any additional support. All right, much love. See you soon.